Okay, hi, welcome back. Any quick questions? Very good. Okay, so uh, today we are going to start actually uh, writing serious code. Well, we're going to start writing code. All code is serious. Um, let's begin with a little modeling exercise. Uh, by now, everyone has fired up Dr. Racket, yes? Yes, very good. Um, here's what Dr. Racket looks like. Uh, there's a little bit of code there, don't worry about it. Um, come on in, come on in. Let's get started. Okay, so uh, I know the most important question in all of your minds is, how did he get it to do that? Do what? Yeah, put stuff side by side. Okay, so never never say CS173 didn't teach you something practical. Uh, you go down to edit and you go to preferences and there in general, uh, you can never have too many preferences, there in general is um, uh, put the interactions window beside the definitions window. So if you have like, you know, a wider screen than a taller screen or you have like a really huge screen, that's a useful way to uh, which is play out your stuff, okay? I like it, you can choose to do whatever you want. Okay, so, Dr. Racket, what does it look like? Um, looks like a big box like this, and uh, by default it's uh, like this, and you've got like a run button, a stop button, and so on, uh, and here's a little prompt, right? What's this part? What goes here? Definitions. Definitions, and what goes here? Interactions. Interactions. Okay, so you write definitions up there, you click run, and then you interact with the environment. Yes? Okay. What kinds of things can you write in the interaction window? It's a pretty broad question. Functions. I beg your pardon? Functions. Functions, you can write the function definitions. More importantly, you can run functions. You can write expressions, right? I mean, that's what it's intended for. You write expressions and try them out, right? It's your calculator. It's a very glorified calculator. Okay. So, uh, what's an example of an expression you could write? You need expression. Yeah, somebody. Yeah. Three. Three. Very good. I like that. That's a really good expression. And I'm not being sarcastic. It's a great expression. Can you give me other expressions you could write? Yeah. Plus three three. Uh, plus three three. Okay. Other expressions? Yes. Circle. Circle, oh, very good. Circle of uh, what? No, uh, just circle. Oh, just circle. Okay. Um, good. <laughs> like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, other expressions? Okay, we've exhausted the space of expressions that are possible in this blind. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to build our way up to a great big language, okay? But we're going to start really small. In particular, today I'm going to start with a language where there cannot possibly be any surprises about what anything means. Okay? Almost true. But um, let's take that as a given for now. So we're going to start with something that is so unsophisticated, even this is not an expression in our language. Okay? You'll have to wait for about a week before you can write something like this. So we're going to start with a really dumb language, the first programming language you ever learned. Okay? When did you learn this language? Yeah, where? Like second grade, third grade, something like that, right? Um, depending on which country you grew up in, you learn this stuff really, really early, right? So arithmetic, that's going to be our programming language. Why is arithmetic a programming language? Does it even qualify for the term? Is that an interesting question to ask? No, because we're not here to define terms, we're here to learn concepts, okay? So I don't care whether arithmetic constitutes a programming language or not for you. But we're just going to take this as our language and go through the mechanics of building interpreters and desugaring functions and so on on something that's so obvious that we don't even have to think about what it's doing. That way we learn the mechanics and then we build our way up to things where we actually have to start doing some thinking. Okay? So today I insist that you do no thinking. Right? Okay. Arithmetic. What is the form of an arithmetic expression? What do arithmetic expressions look like? Do we these are both arithmetic expressions, yes? Are there other ways of writing these arithmetic expressions? 
Yes. Usually using this infix operators. You could use infix operators. So you could write this as you know three plus three. Are there other ways of writing this? Oh yes. So the big words, big words. Okay. Post Which is what? Putting the plus at the end. Uh, three, three plus. Other ways? Yes. If you want to use Scala style, you could do three plus uh, dot plus parentheses three. Three dot plus parentheses three. Correct. Okay. Um, actually, we could. I'm just shocked that all of you have been willing to write three as like three, right? There's about half dozen. I mean, every language has its own notation for writing three, right? There's actual Arabic numerals as opposed to these. Then there's you know Hindi numerals, and there's lots of other numerals, and so on and so forth. Okay, but remember that's all syntax, and we're here to not talk about syntax. Right? So the critical thing we have to do is to first stop talking about syntax. We want to reduce these concepts to representations that computers can process. Okay? We want a data structure, and then we can just work with the data structure and not worry about the surface syntax. Because we will then be able to write different surface syntaxes. We could have a block world surface syntax. We could have an indentation-based surface syntax, and so on, as we talked last time. Okay? So we want a data structure. So we want a data type. And let's write it down. Okay. So I'm going to introduce to you something that you have not seen before, even if you've taken say CS19. Okay. So this is a new piece of racket. It's called define type. Okay. So ground rule for this course: I'm going to be writing code on the board. I will sometimes fire up Dr. Racket, but I generally prefer just writing code because I'm writing. I'm going to write quickly. And I might make small mistakes. Sometimes they're intentional. Sometimes they're not. Um, we, you know, will get things right by the end of the class. But it does mean that there might be, you know, when you're looking at the at the video later on, don't type exactly what's there. You know, there might be some small variations. I will usually blast code out to the class so that you have the definite versions of code. Okay. So you don't have to take notes. Um, if you have your computer on, I will assume you're watching, you're reading email, and I'll periodically ask you to like stop reading email. Okay. Um, so the, you could, you could. I mean, I understand. You might be trying to write the code as you're going along, but in general, try to pay attention here. Um, don't spend all of your time taking notes because there's more useful things you could be doing. Right. You're going to get a video of the whole class, and you'll get the code. So spend your time in class, actively learning. Okay. So teaching a new construct, define type. Okay. And we're going to introduce a new kind of thing called an arithmetic expression. Okay? I'm going to call it an arith C. And I will explain where this C comes from in a little while. Okay? So we want to introduce a new type of expression called an arithmetic expression. Now, how many kinds of arithmetic expressions are there in the world? So now we're doing data analysis, right? We're going from our source syntax trying to go down to a core syntax for our language. How many different kinds of arithmetic expressions are there? Name one kind of arithmetic expression. What is the absolutely essential kind of arithmetic expression we need to have? Yes? Equivalency. I beg your pardon? Equivalency equals. Uh, OK, I'll take that under advisement. Equivalency, yes? With numbers? Numbers, yeah. We're not going to get off the ground without numbers. Okay. <laughs> so numbers, OK? Other kinds of arithmetic expressions. Without numbers, without the basic building block, we can't bottom out, right? We can't have, we can't write anything down. Okay. Other kinds of arithmetic expressions. Yes. Operators. A bigger pardon? Operators. Operators. Well, name one. Plus. Okay. Plus. Other kind of arithmetic expressions. Plus. Any other kind? Yes. I mean. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. We could spend all lecture just naming arithmetic operators, right? So we could have plus, and we can have multiplication, and so on and so forth. Okay, long list of these. Okay, um, how many of these do we absolutely need? We talked about this last class, right? We could shrink this down to a pretty small language. Okay, so we may not even need all of numbers. We could get by with just you know, one or two numbers, etc. Okay, um, in this class, we're not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not interested in re in this particular lecture, I'm not interested in reducing things to an absolute minimum. So we'll give ourselves the privilege of having like entire numbers, right? We could write 23 if we really want to, <laughs> you know, go wild, okay? So we'll give ourselves, you know, for now, just uh, numbers, multiplication, and addition, okay? Now, 
Numbers are pretty easy. They're just numbers, right? They're just atomic things. They don't have a lot of moving pieces in them. Addition. Is addition an atomic thing or is it a compound thing? Is it a complex thing that has pieces inside of it? Addition? Yes. Hey, by the way, this is pretty obvious stuff, right? I'm working us through this because we're going to do the same modeling activity, the same exercise of taking real world information and representing it in the computer, right? That's what we do as computer scientists. So we're taking real world stuff like plus and mod representing it in the computer. We're doing this on something where there's nothing surprising because later on there might be surprising things. So once we get used to this pattern of doing this, we can approach the harder stuff more easily. Right? So that's why I'm, uh, that, my goal is to bore you today, in case that wasn't obvious. Okay, plus, does it have any pieces? Does it have any pieces? No. How? No. Okay. The two answers. How many have voted for no and how many vote for yes? How many vote for no? Handful of you? How many vote for you for yes? Oh, majority wins. Okay, democracy. Okay, what are the pieces? How many pieces and what are the pieces? Yes? Operands. I beg your pardon? The operands. The operands. How many operands does plus have? Oh, God knows. All right, let's just say two, okay? So plus has two operands, right? It has two operands. And what kinds of things are those operands? What can I write in the first position of a plus? Give me one example of something I can write in the first position of a plus. Number. I could write three. Thank you, Amy. Um, anytime we need a three, we know where to turn to. Um, what else can I write? What can I write in the second position of a plus? Amy? Three. Thank you. Okay. Good. Okay? So, certainly the sub expressions of plus are numbers, right? Yes? Among other uh, things. Among other things. Oh, that's a very sophisticated remark. What could you possibly mean by that? Any other arithmetic expressions? Aha. 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 So, um, I could write um, plus, and I'll draw it as a tree. I could write 3 over here, but what else could I write over here instead of a 3? 3 plus 3. I could write another tree, right? What else could I write? Multiplication. Yeah, I could write multiply 1 and 2, right? And do those two have to be numbers? No. No, they could be? Right. Yeah, so they could be plus 7 and 8 and so on, right? So the point is we have a recursive data type. We could write the same kind of thing in each of the pieces. Okay. okay. So going back over here, let's turn this into an actual data definition for the computer. Okay. <coughs> so how many kinds of arithmetic expressions do we have? Well, in the world, may I don't know, but in this particular language, how many have we decided we have? Okay, there are like three or four choices. Let's say it's between one and four. How many vote for one? No votes for one. How many vote for two? A handful of two. Okay. How many vote for three? Oh, did you change your mind? I did. Ah, oh, <laughs> brown students, man. <laughs> yeah. okay. uh, New England weather. How many vote for four? <laughs> four. Four. We got a handful for four. Okay. What are the two kinds? We got votes for two, three, and four. I'm not going to go higher. How many? What are the two kinds of arithmetic expressions we have? Numbers and operations. What are the three kinds we have? Numbers, numbers addition, and multiplication. Numbers, addition, and multiplication. What are the four kinds we have? Hey, somebody voted for four. Brown <laughs> <laughs> students. Okay. Um, so, we could do this two different ways. We can either say there are numbers and operations, or we can say there's just numbers, addition, and multiplication. Okay? They're both perfectly legitimate data definitions. They have slight variations in their consequences for how we write programs. I'm going to take the very simple way out right now and just say there's just three kinds, numbers, addition, and multiplication, okay? That's a fiat decision. It's not worth arguing about because there's a design trade-off <coughs> and both designs are legitimate here. I'm just gonna make that decision because it keeps things a little simpler, okay? So, we're gonna put down that there are three kinds. There are numbers. Um, I'm gonna write this as plus and mult. Okay. okay, now, numbers. How much information do we need to record to record that something is a number? We need to know what about the number? Its value. Yeah, which one it is, right? Which number it is. So, um, uh, actually, 
what is called as N. Okay? Now, we need to tell Dr. Hackett <coughs> what kind of thing is allowed over here. This is, um, what we're doing here is we're, okay, actually, let me do this a slightly different way. Let's say we're in Java. Okay? How might we represent this arithmetic hierarchy, uh, this arithmetic data type in Java? What might we write? Right? Class. A class, that's right, okay. So we have a class that represents arithmetic expressions. Okay, um, I chose to call it C. Okay, and how many subclasses are gonna have? Three, 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 three. three subclasses, right? One for base numbers, one for addition kinds of things, and one for multiplication kinds of things, right? And what do we need to store in the number case? We need to store number. the actual number, right? And what type does it have? It's, well, it's like an int or a num, or you know, imagine that there's some number type, okay? So number n, okay? What about in the plus case? How many things do we need to record? Two. Two, two things, which are the? The two sub-expressions, right? So we might have an L and an R, and each one is of the same type as we've just been defining, right? And that's okay, right? We can refer to the type as we're defining it, and it's not kind of like the world doesn't end and stuff like that. Compilers are okay with that. Good. Okay. What about multiplication? Same story, right? It's got two pieces. It's got an L and an R, and they're both self references right? Okay. This is the same thing we are trying to record in our defined type. Okay. So we write down that it's a number, and I will explain this question mark in a moment. So the left-hand side, if a plus is what kind of thing? Eris C. It's an arith C, and the R is also an arith C. Okay, and. A multiplication similarly has a left-hand side and a right-hand side, and they're both arithmetic. Okay, so you are going to go home and look at this again, right? We're going to post the notes as we always do. You're going to look at the notes and help yourself understand how this picture is the same as the other picture. Okay, all I have done is rotate something by 90 degrees. <coughs> Right? So Java people like to draw their trees going down. Functional people like to draw their trees going like this. Okay? That's where we're weird. Yes, question back there. You didn't need to define number because it's already part of bracket. Yes, that's a very good question. So let's talk about this thing number here, question mark over here, okay? So what actually goes over here in each of these positions is an arbitrary predicate. You can write any predicate you want, okay? You could write a complete function in there that says, is this a number and is it in fact prime? Okay? It is unusual for us to need to write anything other than something that's either built in, like number question mark or string question mark or something like that, or a new data type that we've defined. It's very unlikely we'll need either anything other than those two. Okay? So just like if you were doing this in Java, either use an existing base type or a new class that you've defined. Okay? Um, now in Java, of course, you don't have a choice, right? That's, those are the only things you can put in a type, type field. Here, we actually have the power to write arbitrary things, and there will be occasions when we will actually write a complex predicate in that place, okay? And that's why when we designed this defined type mechanism, we chose to give ourselves the flexibility to write anything we want. Now, number question mark happens to be built into racket, and when you have questions like, is this thing built in? There are three things you can do. What are the three things you can do? Yes? Hit F1 and go to the docs. Uh, hit, the, hit the docs, excellent. Second thing. Try it out in the interactions. Uh, try it out in the interactions. Third thing. Um, or that, that's what I was going to say, but uh, um, ask someone to Google. Get value for your money by asking <laughs> your TAs. Okay? <laughs> Good. All right. Um, all right. So, everyone understand this data definition? Questions? This is basically the same. It's not exactly the same, but it's close enough to what you got in the Java case. Okay? It's just a sort of functional mapping of the Java thing. Question, question, yes. Do we actually have to write or it's C question mark or does it just sort of fall out? <laughs> ah, very good question. Uh, these kind of mechanical questions are great. 
define type automatically defines for you the RITC question mark. Okay. Oh, and just in case you're wondering, like racket, rack, racket, list, and scheme all have this very, very flexible syntax where you can, like, any almost any non-space character can be part of a name. So a number, the question mark here is just a convention. It's not like you know, question mark doesn't actually mean anything to the language when you put it at the end. Okay, that's just the name of the thing. Okay, and if you play around, you'll discover that you can define some very interesting uh, identifier names. So you can. The following, for example, is a perfectly legitimate identifier name. Um, <laughs> Knock yourself out. Okay. All right. Other questions. There was another question there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm a little bit confused about the uh, the idea behind the number question mark. What is it doing there? Okay. This is doing exactly the same thing as. Let me refer to this thing over here. Okay. Oops. Not what I meant to do. It's this thing over here. Okay. So if you were writing a class number, okay, and you said uh, maybe, uh, you know, int underscore n, and you said, uh, you know, your constructor were, right? Mm -hmm. So, you needed to say that this has one field. Um, I guess I called it underscore n here, but it's it's saying there's one field and it's of type number, right? And in this case, I called it an int, right? Okay. That's what it's doing. It's Just saying that checking. it's doing. It's actually going to check for you. Okay. Okay. So if you were to type, so if you were to invoke the numc constructor with something other than a number, it will actually halt with an error. Okay. All right. Now, I've got a very simple example of, and, and okay, so now I'm going to show you how you can use it as well. So I've got a very simple example coded up for you that does nothing recursive, nothing complicated. Okay? So we tell ourselves, tell Dr. Racket which language we're programming in. Okay, we're going to use the language PLAI, which is the name for the old version of this textbook. Um, and so these are extensions to Racket that are built for PLAI. Okay. This is just a magical incantation, just like every time you write a shell script, you need to say, which shell scripting language am I in? Right? So the same way you tell Racket which language you're programming in, because it actually has like, you know, has non-parenthetical languages and all sorts of other things built in. But because I'm perverse, I'm not going to show them to you. Okay? Um, parentheses, all you get. Okay. So define type animal is an animal. It makes a new kind of thing called an animal. I'm going to say there's only one kind of animal, a yak. Okay? And it has a height, which is a number. Um, how do I make an actual yak? This is the constructor, right? This is the equivalent of new in Java. I say make a yak of height 10. All right? Is that clear? Okay. So I'm going to then bind it to y. So I'm going to say y is now this new yak. Okay? And I can ask for its height by using a selector. There's two ways to pull things back out. One is to use pattern matching, and the other is you can directly select out of it. So I'm going to ask for its height, and its height is going to be 10. So if I write a test that says, is its height 10, it's going to come back and say, yes, good. That's a good test. The answer is 10. Okay, so the testing framework is built in, and it provides pretty verbose output. And you can read the documentation to figure out how to tell it to say, don't tell me unless there's an error, which is probably what you want by default. Okay? All right. Another way you can destructure is you can write something called a type case. So I've defined a function f that takes an argument A, which is expected to be an animal, and I'm saying match against all the different kinds of animals that there are. So the expectation is that you will have as many lines in the type case as you had in the defined type. Okay? So here there's one line, so here there's only one line. And it does some syntax checking. So if you write a type case, you know, if you wrote, you know, GNU over there, it would say, sorry, not an animal. Okay? Um, so this is now pulling out, this is the equivalent of pulling out the field. Okay? It's pulling out the value and binding it to h, and then if I multiply it, you know, I get some answer back. Now, I'm also putting out notes where I'm going to give, I've got more examples like this. So you will get examples like this throughout, throughout the course, okay? So this is just your first introduction. There is some documentation, and we're going to be giving you examples. So I don't expect you to remember all of this that you just saw over here. I'm just showing you, this is, this is pretty much it. If you've learned basic racket, you'll learn these new constructs, you now know 
80% of 85% of the language you need for this course. Question. If uh, YAC has multiple fields, yes. um, how does it know which one? It matches by position. Okay? <coughs> this is very important. It doesn't actually match by name, even though I've used the same. I, and in fact, I've used different names right here, right? I called it height over here and I called it H over here. Just to illustrate that, that it matches by position. Okay. Other questions? Yes. So how do you match to something not in the first position? How do you match to well, some? You, you, you said that it matches height to H by position. What if what if Yak had multiple fields? Like what if Yak had a height and a weight? Okay. It's a good weight for a Yak. <laughs> They're, they're pretty heavy. Pieces. So it's, look, it's, the, it's thousand and some unit system, exactly. <laughs> and let's compute like the uh, you know the sort of the the, the impact of a yak, impact factors for yaks. Uh, height times the weight. Okay, and this should be uh, what uh, uh, times a thousand. Okay, actually, let me uh, do it by hundred. Okay, so, uh, fat fingers. I missed a zero there. Okay, all right. Um, a little helpful tip, you can hit F5 to execute a program. You don't have to go click on the run button. Okay. So here's what we did. We added a second field, just as you asked for. We selected it out by position, H and W. And again, notice I called it height and weight over here. I called it H and W over here. The only time you need to know those names is if you want to pull it out directly using the selector. Okay. This is like a dot. Right? This is like the Java dot selector. So you can pull it out directly, or you can pull it out with pattern matching. I suggest giving very informative, descriptive names there, because you will almost rarely ever use those names again, but they're very good documentation. Okay? When you do the selection using the pattern matching, you can use you know, more abbreviated names so your programs don't get too large. Right? So it's type and special character? I beg your pardon? It's type and special character for very long. It's only, it's, it's hyphen is only in the case, okay, so yak dash height was defined as a identifier by Dr. Racket, okay? So hyphen is not a special character, but yak dash height was built for you automatically by the define type mechanism, just as yak dash weight was built for you automatically, okay? And so I've written two cases, test, one of them is a good test and one of them is a bad test, and it's telling you, okay, look, f of y went bad, um, this was the expe this was the uh, expected actual output. This was the expected output, and here's where the error is. Okay. Yes. This is a kind of minor detail. If you have a type uh, or a, a, a dash b with a field c, and then you want to define it type a with a b dash c. Ah, that would actually cause it. Uh, that would cause a name clash at the second definition. Mm -hmm. And you deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Yes. So what if you want to define a yak, but you don't necessarily want to define the superclass animal? There is another mechanism for doing this, something called a structure definition. We will so almost never do that in this course that it's not worth talking about. Okay. Okay? Meaning, we, we, this, we'll never write examples that have only one case. So every, from now on, we'll have like seven or eight cases. That's going to be the case. The, so this is so rarely going to happen that it's, I could give you more syntax, basically. Okay, and I don't want to overburden you with more syntax. I'd rather teach you a small number of constructs and you can just write, you know, just give it a bogus name. It, it won't happen. Yeah. Okay. It happens once that I can remember. Yeah, other questions? Once? Yeah, once. Once. Maybe a second time. <laughs> <laughs> can, you can you nest types with like define type and then inside it? No, no, but, you, but the point is this, um, this could be referring to another data type in there. So you can certainly nest instances of them. Okay. Again, I don't know of any reason we really need to do that either. But you can certainly nest. You can have a reference to another instance of something else. Just like a recursive reference is exactly that, right? Yeah. OK, other questions? This is mechanics. It's fine. It's good. You need to get comfortable with the mechanics. I don't expect you to have learned it all here, but you're going to go home and try these out, right? For example, you're going to give yourself another kind of animal, right? You're going to give yourself GNUs as well, and maybe camels and so on, right? And by doing that, you will get practice with this. Yes. And if you have problems, what do you do? Get value for your money. That's right. OK. All right. So um, we're now ready to actually write our interpreter.
Uh, this may prove a bit of an anticlimax because it's not particularly complicated, but then we'll talk about some interesting things after we've done it. to write our first interpreter. Okay. The moment I write this down, the moment I say E is an Aritzi kind of thing, what should I immediately do after that? Yes. Excellent, excellent. CS19 people to rescue. Good. Okay, how many cases were there? Three. Three. One, two, three. Do you remember what they were? Yeah, the first one was numbers. Plus. Okay, plus and multiple. Okay? How many pieces were in a number? One. One. How many pieces were in a plus? Two. Two. How many pieces in a mult? Two. Okay, good. <coughs> so we're now trying to write a program that is going to convert, it's going to convert arithmetic expressions into the corresponding number that you would get if you evaluated it, right? And return a number. So if we're given a number and we're trying to produce a number, well, there's a lot of things we could do, right? <laughs> we could uh, add one to it, we could gratuitously multiply it by one, or we could just, uh, yeah, okay, good. All right, now, in the plus case, what are we trying to do? We're trying to add them together, right? Pretty obvious, yes? Okay, so we add L and R. And in the multiplication case, we multiply L and R. Okay. Congratulations, you've just written your first and what? Speak up, speak up. We can't hear you in the front. Yes, that's exactly the right question. Why are we not? What do we, what's, what do, we do? Did I pull a fast one? What fast one did I pull? Yes. You can't use the star on. Ah, Aaron's excellent, seat. excellent. He's reasoning by type. Made me really happy. Okay? <laughs> I can't use star. Well, what can I star? Numbers. I can star numbers. Okay. What kind of thing is L? It's an Aritzi. And Aritzis are numbers. So what's the problem? It's not literally numbers. The, 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 numbers so, okay, there's going to be a lot of confusion here. And some of you are going to be like, yeah, that sounds right. So this is confusing. This is actually confusing if you've never seen this before. So we'll take it slowly. Yes. Uh, Aritzis are not numbers themselves. They're either numbers, uh, num c plus c or multiple. Uh, well, uh, ah, ah. So there's two levels of confusion here. Okay, it's two levels of confusion. The first level of confusion is that even if the left-hand side happened to represent a number. I'm going to do this kind of like very pedantic speech here because it's, it's actually really important. Even if the left-hand side happens to represent a number, it is not actually represented as a number. It's represented as a num c that has the number sitting inside of it, right? So clearly what we need to do is we need to get the number back out. So num c of n. Okay. Let me just erase all of this stuff. <laughs> yes? Is that better? No. no. Well, I'll tell you what. For the quality of test cases you guys are going to write, that's going to work just fine. <laughs> yes? You need to call interpret because that might actually be... Even Why would this not work? Does it work sometimes? Yes, yes, it works sometimes. Why does it work sometimes? 
If your test case, what is the test case on which this will work? The representation of plus three two, or hey, a new number. How about that? Okay. okay, the representation of plus three two. This is going to work just fine, and you're not going to notice that it doesn't work all the time. What is the test case on which it does not work? Three times two plus three plus two. Plus three. Just stick to pluses. Plus. Plus plus three three. Yeah. So if you have a nested plus, this isn't going to work, right? Because we, we don't have a concrete number there. We have an expression that needs to be reduced to a number, right? Do we have a function that takes expressions and reduces them to numbers? Yes. Interp. Interp, the one we're trying to define, OK? So uh, I'm going to leave this piece of code up for a moment, and I'm going to do this in the multiplication case correctly. We're going to interp the left, and we're going to interp the right. Okay. okay, is everyone satisfied with the multiplication case? Okay, yes, everyone? Good. So there are multiple flaws here, okay? First is not looking at your data types and thinking through your data definition. The other one is even if you know that there's actually a number there, it's better to just trust the recursion, right? I mean, because you know, even if it actually is a number, guess what's going to happen in the next step? If you call interp, it's going to go here, it's going to go to the number case, it's going to pull out the number and return it, right? So just, you got to, this is a common mistake I see. So even though it sounds obvious, I'm going to say it. You got to trust the recursion, okay? The most common mistake I see is students saying, well, how about right here, I'll just like check whether it's a this kind of a thing or a, that's the function you're defining. It checks whether it's at this kind of a thing or at that kind of a thing. Don't do it again. Be lazy, for goodness sake. You're good at it. You're part of the students. OK? So. OK? Now, congratulations. You have your first interpreter. The other thing that's a little confusing when we talk about these kinds of things, and, 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 and 173 is full of this kind of confusion. If you actually think it through, if you actually think, which you're not allowed to do today, remember, but if you actually think, it turns out this is horribly confusing stuff because we're writing a program that takes the representation of a program and, like, what is arithmetic? Well, arithmetic produces numbers. So, you know, you're tempted to think, well, this thing right here, why isn't that just a number? Well, it is a number, but it's not a number because it's an arith C. But when you interpret it, it's going to become a number. But it's, it's like the potential to be a number, but it's not actually a number. And, ah, oh, oh, your head can hurt if you start thinking, OK? So we'll try to avoid that by and large. Um, but you have to be really careful about this sort of thing. It's very, very easy to get mixed up between the representations of things, the things that are being represented, the things they are going to evaluate to. Those are three different things, okay? And it's too easy to put the wrong thing in the wrong place and get yourself into a big mess. Okay? So we're going to write actually very small programs like this, but they will often be small programs that will take a long time to write. This is like the dual of like 169. Right? Um, actually, it's not for 169, you're going to think a lot too. But it's, there's, there, you will get no glory from writing thousands of lines of code, except till you get to like the Python part of this assignment. There's just no glory in thousands of lines of code. It'll turn out that you, know, you will have a 20 line program that will take roughly oh, about 10 hours or so. You know? So, roughly about you know, two lines an hour would be good. <laughs> okay? And if you write more than that, you will make mistakes, then debugging it will take even longer. So, it's just against uh, trying to be clever. Okay, now I want to do one other thing. Where's my right here. I don't want two two other things. Um, first is well, you know, there's more to life than arithmetic, but there's also more to arithmetic than these three operations than these three constructs. Um, we might want to add, say, subtraction or division or things like that, right? In fact, with these two things, we can define subtraction, yes? Let me define subtraction. A minus B is? 
a plus uh, minus 1 times b, right? So we have numbers for the minus 1, we have plus, and we have the times, right? So we can define subtraction with this. So that's a really good exercise in desugaring, okay? I'm not going to talk about it in class, but I have actually written up a bunch of notes about it, and uh, we'll push them to the web at some point uh, today. I've, I've been making edits just before class, so I want to just make sure everything's synced up. Uh, but we're going to push some notes, and, I, and, I'll, and I've written a desugarer there for you, okay? So what is a desugarer? Well, it's the reason we have this letter C over here, okay? What I do there is I define a function from arith S to arith C. So S stands for the surface language that we want to provide somebody, and C stands for the core language that we want to actually interpret. So D sugar is a function from arith S to arith C. Interp is a function from arith C to numbers. You compose the two and you get a function from arith S to numbers. Okay? So you can add more surface syntax. There's actually some subtlety to defining the um, D sugar, and you have to read the notes. Subtraction is pretty straightforward. But I add another example, which is unary minus. And unary minus is actually kind of interesting. <laughs> Who thought, right? So go read the notes. Um, I've also given you some information about something called quote and uh, you know how you can write some of these test cases better, something called read and quote. So it's all there in the notes. There's a fair bit of notes to read, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. Just type in the code, you'll get a good feel for it. Question? Yes? Can you talk about why you use num c plus c multi in the Define type, um, but here you just use num plus um, Because this is exactly the kind of sloppiness I will do in class. <laughs> That's a great question. Okay, I'm going to be sloppy about this sort of thing uh, because I'm, you know, just because I'm sloppy. But should they match? They absolutely <laughs> had better match. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for catching me. And uh, please do catch me on these kinds of things. Yes. Never mind. I just didn't hear. Okay. Understand. Yes. Okay. Those should be C's there. Um, and the reason I have the C's here, by the way, is because in arith S, I have num S and, you know, I have a num S and a plus S and a multi S, but I also have a, like a minus S or something and a unary minus S. I have a binary minus S and a unary minus S, okay? So I want to keep the two, two well separate. Okay. All right. We made a very subtle assumption in this interpreter. Anyone? Very subtle assumption. It's so subtle, you don't even realize it's an assumption. That's how beautiful it is. <laughs> yes? The, the expression E that we get passed in would be correct? Oh, yeah, but that's, that's just taken. Yeah, yes, that is correct, but that's a given. We're just assuming that. And if it were not the case, <laughs> if it were not the case, it would be caught over here. OK? Well, I mean, by correct, I assume you mean that it's an root C. That's yeah. a well-formed root C. Yeah, and if not, you'd get an error right here. Okay, so good. That's that's a good reason to use that. Yeah. There are no cycles. Yes, um, but the reason we can conclude that is because this is a uh, tree-shaped data type, so it would have to terminate, and uh, I haven't given you any way to create a cycle, so that's a, I can assume that. Let me do this as a quiz. Yeah. Watch very carefully. I'm going to write four expressions on the board. Very, very carefully, okay? Now, here is your question. Which of these are like the others, and which ones are not? Okay, so I have quite expression A, B, C, and D. Which ones are the same, and which ones are different? It's JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> Any guesses? <laughs> we've, we've stunned them into silence. Okay. Well, what might this evaluate to? What might 1 plus 2 evaluate to? What's a possible answer? Three? Okay, good. Our favorite number. Our favorite number. This is set up specially for Amy. Okay. Um, what else might 1 plus 2 evaluate to? 
might evaluate 3.0, it might evaluate to, you could be in C++ and goodness knows what plus is actually doing. <laughs> really, anything. Okay, what does string 1 plus string 2 evaluate to? Very obviously it evaluates to one, two. string 1, 2, right? Equally obviously, it evaluates to? Three. Three. Really? Or just the number. Could three. any language possibly do this? <laughs> PHP does <laughs> We conjectured PHP. Joe was not able to reproduce it, but I was pretty sure it was Perl and Variable, and Ben helped me figure, can we, uh, help me get that. Yes. So, go uh, on. <laughs> anyone, anyone remember Tickle? Yes, exactly. Okay. So, my point here is, what, this is this is the point of the course. Okay. We're trying to get past the syntax. We're trying to get to the semantics. We're trying to get to meaning. Okay, what does it actually mean, not what, what does the syntax superficially say it is. <coughs> now, what is the relevance of this to our interpreter today? What does plus in the surface syntax map to? <coughs> it maps to? Numeric addition. Numeric addition in what? Is it 32 bit addition? If I give it like two numbers that are just the right size, well, I, here's a simple question to ask. If I add two numbers, can I possibly get a negative answer? Two positive numbers, can I possibly get a negative answer? Right? Now, this, you go to the math department, they you know, <laughs> But we have a whole department dedicated to this question, right? If I add two positive numbers, what are all the different ways I can get negative answers out of it? Right? Because there's actually multiple negative answers you could get, right? So. We haven't said, we just sort of said, oh, we're just going to do whatever Racket Plus does. It turns out that's not a bad choice because Racket Plus is actually extraordinarily smart about like adding numbers and adding only numbers. But it's got like 25 different kinds of numbers. Um, if you really want to scare yourself, go into type Racket and type plus and hit enter and see the type you get out. And make sure you have a very tall screen. Okay? <laughs> so we're just using Racket Plus. But maybe that's not what we want. Now, this course is not about arithmetic, and therefore, I'm not going to waste time talking about this. I'm not going to spend, I'm going to spend a tiny bit of time in about a week talking about this again. But, so keep this in mind. Remember this. But we're not about arithmetic, so we're not going to care. But when we start getting to other features, it's going to really matter that we think through what it is we want. What is our specification? What do our test cases say? This is why we should write test cases down. What do we want? as opposed to what does the implementation do and how do we bend the will of the implementation to do what we want. Okay? We'll, talk, we'll devote like a chunk of our lecture to talking about this after we've done a few more examples. But just as a hint, when we get to Lambda, you know, maybe it does what we want, maybe not. <coughs> Think about that. Good. I would like to introduce our course staff, if they're still here. Where are our course staff? Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Okay, here's your value for money. Stand up, man. <laughs> Give them, give them good value. Okay. All right. Who are you? Uh, I'm John. Login J O N. Next. I'm P K. Login P K. I'm Scott S C Newman. I'm Joe. Joe. I'm John. I'm Liam. Liam. I'm Brian. Good. Do we have everyone? Are we missing anyone? No, that's all of us. Okay. Very good. And hi, I'm Shrew. Shrew. Nice to meet you. Hi. Nice to meet you. Okay. Um, that's your core staff. Uh, they're awesome. Um, <laughs> we had we had two core staff in uh, March. We had three. We roughly added one core staff a, a, a month. So by the time we get to December, we'll have about three or four more. Um, so uh, they're, they're they're great. Um, they've worked very hard to get the course to the point where it is, and uh, we'll take all blame for any further shortcomings. Yes. Um, we posted notes. We more importantly have our first homework, which will take care of our uh, space problem in the class. Um, you are going to learn parcel tongue. Yes, parcel tongue is going out at what time? Some uh, point. One, one o'clock, let's say. Yeah, we're putting some finishing touches on it. We'll, we'll go out at one o'clock. The first assignment, so we've designed this language. It's typical of scripting languages, but we've made some careful design choices because they're things we're trying to teach and illustrate to you. Uh, that's why you're learning this new language. The first assignment is a testing assignment. Why are we starting with testing? Well, because everything should start with testing. Why else are we starting with testing? Well, that's correct, as they should. And why else are we starting with testing? 
Uh, pardon me? Uh, well, yes, yes, you do, you do. I will be very open about that. Why else are we starting with testing? The answer was we suck at it, by the way. Yes. Uh, why else are we starting with testing? Yes. Get us used to writing tests. Yeah, well, yes, yes. Why else are we starting with testing? We don't know how to do anything else yet. You don't know how to do anything else yet. Excellent. That's actually very true. Why else are we starting with testing? Because you can't write test cases till you've started to understand the language. So what we wanted to do was to say, here's a language, please go and understand it, right? Now, honestly, exactly, right? We knew you wouldn't. So he said, how can we force you to learn it? Well, hey, we'll make it do for a grade, right? So this brown students are so great conscious. It's actually not, it's very frustrating. But possibly for <laughs> some inducement, you might just care about your grade a little bit. And so go start writing some tests, okay? So this one's not going to be like massively graded. It's not going to be like 10% of your course grade or anything. But it is a way to force you to get to know the language. So please go start writing test cases. Contact us if you have help. Everyone should be on Piazza by now. Um, everyone should be like, you know, sign up for the course. You'll get a course code. I'm going to send Joe some more email addresses. Get a course code so you can start uploading these. Okay? Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, quick announcement before you're all gone. If you do not